Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731 1230. That's 731 1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1 866 820 that's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Hi, this is Jennifer Solis with the Nevada Cannabis News. To my right is Kurt Dukoc, Raymond Fletcher, and Perry Haichu. We have William Beach Baker as our producer and, of course, Lawrence on the board. He always makes me sound good. Um, I'd like to remind everybody, if you are listening to this as a rebroadcast, don't call in, stoners. Okay? (laughs) Hey, bro. What was that number again? I'm going to (laughs) call. All right. Um, First in the news, oh, my God, there was a bust last last Tuesday that was just hellacious. Like, what, 30 pounds or 13 pounds taken out of this house? What did they have? About 40 40 plants, something like that. Yeah, they had a they had a whole lot of plants and a whole lot of finished material and I guess some butane to do some blasting and it was two patients. Well, out of that's Utah. all that's all good with the appropriate licensing. <laughs> they had no MME license to speak of. Um, they had a pretty good filtration system because the neighbors said that they didn't even smell anything until after the bus. They didn't uh, release how they came across that information. Was it a quote anonymous tip or? Uh, probably somebody bragging, you know, which is why I would never do anything illegal because, you know, Kurt would lead him right to the silverware. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, hey, when you don't do anything illegal, you don't have to cover your tracks. Yeah, but That's true. I mean, they were the people that were residing in the home had medical marijuana cards, like not the doctor's recommendations. They had physical cards, right? But they did not have their amended licenses. They didn't have any additional paperwork to say, hey, we need these extra plants for for this use or whatever, because I've heard of these exemptions being used in court before. And actually people, I don't want to say getting away with it, but uh, having the doctor's note be recognized in def- not in defiance of state law, but in addition to state law, I think as a defense, a, yeah, just yeah. a little bit of flexibility. I mean, they only had 30 or 40 plants. I feel like if they would have gone, taken that extra step, they might've been able to give themselves a little bit of legal protection. I mean, you're growing 200 plants, you know, I don't think that's going to hold up, but I've heard that, you know, when you're juicing cannabis or when you're making edibles or things like that, it takes a lot more material. So it does. And if you're blasting and making BHO and you're making, um, and you're also making Rick Simpson oil or Phoenix tears, it does take a lot of material. Yeah. But once again, I think that they didn't claim any of those, uh, any of that when they were they busted. did not i think their excuse was a little bit more unique maybe you could elaborate on that well their excuse was that they were gearing up uh to sell to dispensaries and and that is not an excuse for you know sitting on 13 pounds of cannabis in your home um they they said that they were gearing up for the dispensaries so the dispensaries could buy the cannabis from them and um and they could profit as patients. And they tell the cops this. They straight but, up told the cops this. And in theory, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're within your legal plant limit because you can, as a patient, sell to these dispensaries one time. That's now, true. There's been confusion as to whether that's one time per dispensary or one time period. Total. But you know, I think we're advising people just one time total to err on the side of caution, of course. But, I mean, that's just... I, I, I don't know how I would I, I would just try to come up with a better a better excuse if it was me. But, you know, I, I, I feel for him still. You know, it's a shame I, to see I people get, feel that get popped. I, but I do feel for them, especially in in the in the fact that they got their child taken away from them for oh, CPS. Man. That's about how that's I, my I extent. That, of, I didn't hear that side of the story. That's my extent of of feeling for these guys. These guys were doing some illegal crap yeah. as far as I'm concerned. And they, they were doing caught. it. They were doing it. They knew that it was wrong or, you well, know. I guess I can change my tone and say I don't feel for him, but I'm a little bit disappointed. Well, and also and also they were kind of, they were profiteers in a way because they weren't even Nevada residents. They were two guys from Utah that came down here and were going to try to find a, a way to profit off of 
Oh, hell, you know, people in Nevada, basically. Either. Yeah, so they, they'd they been down here eight months renting a house, um, and they, uh, the guy and his wife have a, a little daughter. I, I think that she was under five years old, and they had the, you know, the, the BHO. They were blasting in the house. Uh, um, well, I guess the lesson learned is, you know, they're still watching you, even though these these positive stories are coming out. Oh, you know, the government is uh, working on, you know, getting rid of the medical marijuana federal funding and, you know, all these positive things that are coming out of the news as to the laxing of law enforcement priority to cannabis. Don't kid yourself. There's still a, a team of people out in Nevada looking for you. Oh, yeah. It's either SCORE or Rodeo or one of those uh, nice little Nevada teams that are going to be looking for you. Those are the bad boys that are going to bust in your door um, if you're doing this kind of illegal stuff, and, and especially this large this is not a little tiny operation. This was not like people going 24 plants and, oops, we got a pound because we harvested and we're just a little bit over. This is like anywhere between, they say, 13 and 30 pounds. Um, a good amount. And all the plants and all the other stuff. And they were continuing to grow. So, I mean, they obviously they were Sitting on either the selling that already or they were growing way over what they're allowed to have. And as I say, coming from another state, that's not what the that clause in the law was for. That one-time <laughs> buy was for patients of Nevada right. to supply Nevada dispensaries with the the different uh, the different strains and t cuttings and stuff that they're going to need, well, not for people the... from Utah to come down here, grow a bunch of weed, and sell a bunch of weed in the state of Nevada, <laughs> and then go back to Utah with their money. Right. Well, well, um, Met Metro Metro said that they had, had thirty nine pounds. Thirty nine. Thirty nine plants. Ooh. 13 pounds, and a garage had about $10,000 worth of equipment used to grow grow the cannabis and dangerous chemicals. And and that we, we assume it's butane and they were blasting because that's what they said. It was for BHO. It was for honey oil. Um, so butane would be the dangerous chemicals. What's interesting, though, is these two gentlemen, Brent and Brock, they both have criminal records that are related to narcotics in Utah. The men have medical marijuana licenses, and like you said, they claimed on plan of selling it to local dispensaries. But how can t they're dumb dumbs? I don't, I don't feel for them. They're, I don't feel it all. If you're going to come dealers. into our state, yes, exactly they're right. They're not Kurt. patients. They're drug dealers. If you're going to come into our state with a specific purpose of illegally growing over your limit to profit, when well, we already have plenty of people coming into our state and taking opportunities to open cannabis businesses from Nevada residents because they have the money, because they have the clout, because they have the political pull. You know, I... So you just feel like it's another case of people stepping on our toes? Exactly. I feel like they're... I feel like I've been taken advantage of by them. No. Oh, well, you know, and, and that's profiteering and carpet bagging. We're used to it here in Nevada because every time something comes up, we've had people from Colorado come down and go, we know how to do it better. And then all the legislators and all of our policymakers are going, yay, they know how to do it better. We don't, Nevadans don't need to do this. Let's, you go contract with outside companies. And that's what pissed me off. And I like Tick. I like Tick Siegerbloom. But what he was saying was, get some of these guys from Colorado. Get some of these people from here. They know what they're doing it's like we know what we're doing we've been doing it for 13 years here yeah, absolutely patients have been waiting how long for access to medical marijuana dispensaries cultivation long and, time you know ne nearly a decade and a half you know and it's about time that we as Nevadans have the opportunity to provide for ourselves we don't need no outsiders all right more from the local front uh let's see medical lawsuits medical marijuana lawsuits at the city and county level and at the state level too there are a lot of lawsuits and a lot of paper flying around this and we don't know whether um the dispensaries in clark county will open up on time i think that henderson and everybody else will open up on time but it looks like the gb sciences nevada llc they want approval for a las vegas dispensary but when they missed out on the state and they are suing um the state file uh, faces a lawsuit from seven dispensary applications that want to open up in unincorporated clark county and there are lawsuits going around 
all over the place on this one. Well, GB Sciences is not only suing the uh, the state; it's also suing some of the uh, some of its competitors, Desert Air Wellness and New Leaf, which are the ones that are getting. Uh, well, Desert Air is getting another or their a location. first hearing tomorrow. No, they already oh, have, no, no. A they have a location. They have a location. They they withdrew. They're the ones that withdrew their application, and then the. St- city said oh we're going to allow you to rescind your withdrawal of your application so they're going to be hearing their application tomorrow at city council for the very first time and you know then you know uh, raymond and i were looking at this on uh the city website they're not going to let public comment on one of these matters they put in big bold letter this is not a public hearing now first off the city is violating the rules by hearing an application after the application process closed. Mm -hmm. You you know, so how, all right, if you have a deadline and I come in after the deadline, why should I be able to submit after those before me had the exact same opportunities and chose to turn their stuff in on time? But they had, this is the team that had submitted their application, then took it back out and then tried to resubmit it? Yes. Oh, they did resubmit it. They did resubmit it. The, The city council is hearing it tomorrow. Did they just, hear? Did they hear their case before? No, like during no, the big no, process, they no, never no, had no. to go in front. This no, is a special no. hearing just for them. Yeah, mm-hmm. without they public did, comment. Without but, public comment, so exactly. Even though the so what the issue is is that the public was able to comment on all of the other potential licensees. Yep. Except for this one, and you feel like they're purposely trying to circumvent that. Yep. I mean, but if public comment doesn't really matter, and the legislators have already made up their mind, you know, this is the kind of push and pull. Well, the thing is, is that if if I withdraw my application, um, if I withdraw my application, then I should have to resubmit an application. And if it, the resubmittal of the application is past the deadline, right. so there you is no to wait. resubmittal. So you think they should have had to wait for the next round of ap- potential applicants next year? Yeah, they, 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 withdrew their, their they withdrew their application. And one of the reasons they did withdraw their application is there was a lot of opposition from the residents who lived right behind where they want to open their thing, which happened to many other people. And they had to sit there say, and go through yeah. all that scrutiny. Yet this, this somehow this group is going to yeah, you know, I, not be scrutinized by those people and the public? Well, I, I, would, I would have to say, look at who their lawyer is. Well, I remember driving through the Scotch 80s and seeing those, oh, you know, no pot shops in our neighborhood and this and that. And there was vocal opposition from the Spanish Oaks neighborhood for no, yeah. the West Sahara uh, potential dispensary that was going to be on the, what, the north side of Sahara there near Valley View. Yes. And uh, definitely there was active and organized community resistance for some of these shops. So that's very clever. Who is their lawyer? Jay Brown. Oh, that's very clever. I, I have to argue to with you that. on that because some of the people that were opposing these applications didn't even live in the war in the council yeah, ward. Just, just showing up to make noise. But that's <laughs> but that's not Perry's issue. Perry said that they had vocal and they had well organized opposition, and they did. They did. They had all these little mm-hmm. signs, and that one uh, Teresita. I'll remember her name forever because she got up and said that she lived in every single one of the districts and that, and that you know. Right, yeah, just looking to stir trouble where she could. She could. I was wondering if she was paid by somebody. I mean, she was that good. Oh, it could be anyone. You know, people have their own personal stories that, you know, we aren't aware of. Maybe she had a family member who was you know, addicted to drugs and she blamed that on cannabis use. We, you know, who knows what her story was. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, speaking of, uh, well, this is not a this is not a local story. This is more in northern Nevada. Oh, hold up, there's a, there's a oh. little more on oh, this wait. one. You there's know what what, what 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 I what I call this is pulling a Sisolak. Oh God! They're pulling a Sisolak. They're changing the rules in the middle, and the district atter- according to the attorney general's office. Um, uh, I can't find this lady's first name, but the attorney in the case said the state does not dispute that it issued registrations to applicants who did not comply with the law. So the state is admitting they issued applicants, they issued registrations to applicants who did not comply with the law. So if you have money, If you are connected, you don't have to follow the rules because the state is admitting they are above the law. 
Well, so now the question remains, how much can we change the rules? If the rules are being changed this much, how, what else are we going to change? Well, are it depends we on how much to, money you have. Well, are we going to change to allow more dispensaries? Are we going to change to lock out any future dispensaries, potentially? You know, That's the goal. That is the goal, to lock out anybody new oh, from I coming saw, in. I know. I saw this back during the, the legislative session. There was going to be two teams when this yep. uh, was all said and done. There was going to be Team A who had licenses who want to lock everyone else out and Team B who wants to break in. Of course, that's capitalism. But uh, yeah, you, you did. Know, we'll, basically, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Basically, you did call this. You just you said that you know what the, this is going to happen. Everybody's going to circle their wagons that got dispensary licenses and try to shut out everybody else. And that's kind of what these or, ma marijuana business organizations have kind of uh, been, you know, gearing toward, gearing towards toward, for sure, toward. for sure. Okay, well, now can I talk about Northern Nevada? Gladly. <laughs> My bad. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, you know, in Northern Nevada, you would think that they would have dispensaries and kind of move them, uh, you know, away from each other because it's very sparsely populated up there. Okay. But Aren't they getting five? No. <laughs> well, three of them are going to be within a five mile radius in Incline Village, Nevada. Oh, you're what? talking about you're talking about in Washoe. Yeah, but that's that's that makes sense. I mean, at, when you look at it on paper, you're like, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, all, all the people are spread out, but it's a ski town. You know, I remember looking at the demographics when the Col when Colorado uh, came out and and they said, oh, you know, county by county, city by city, this is how they voted. Sure. And in like Steamboat Springs and Aspen and places like that, they got seven seventy to eighty percent. Yeah. Of, uh, of the vote for cannabis, so I'm not surprised at all that a disproportionate amount, and also the uh, disproportionate well, amount of money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and once again, they thought they were supposed to follow the same procedures as we had down here in Las Vegas, where the state ranks these applications on a blind, app, you know, a blind thing. They don't know who they're ranking, so the odds that in all theory. that three out of the five landed right there, where all the money is. I mean, it just it it just doesn't ring true to me. Well, I see what you're saying. <laughs> three of the five are ending up in Incline Village and Crystal Bay, which are about that's a five mile radius of each other. Mm -hmm. And so th to have three of them right there, and that's also right on the California Nevada border. And if you look at that, that that's a good that's a good deal too. But South Lake Tahoe has got zero. Do we know how many applications were submitted for South Lake Tahoe compared to Incline Village? Maybe they were, maybe there was a like a cluster of applications in that area because they wanted to go for where they perceived the money would be, rather than go to a, uh, you know, less than desirable, as they perceived it uh, location. I mean, how many how many dispensary applications did you see in East Las Vegas on like you know Hollywood and Sahara or like somewhere like that? You know. Well, I would say that that would have to be that would that would be smarter because they're the amount of population that's over at Hollywood and Sahara. Uh, they're probably more, you know, they're probably patients over there too. Well, of course there are patients of a different type on that end of town. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't want to put it that way. I, mean, I grew up on the east side. I know what's up. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Kurt, for for being. The non politically correct one. <laughs> all, all right, right so we're going to go ahead and take our break. Yeah, I'm just stepping all over today. We'll have more local and regional news after the break. Please stay tuned. 420 moment. 420 moment. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required we have of doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. The Vaughn Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com 
You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702-218-5226 or Kurt, K-U-R-T, at WeCan702.org. <laughs> Welcome back. That sound indicates it's time for our 420 moment. Uh, today we're going to honor local assemblywoman Michelle Fiore. Michelle Fiore was born in Brooklyn, New York, and she is the GOP um, Republican that's in charge of the Department of Taxation in the Assembly this session. Um, Michelle Fiore it has been in the medical industry for a long time. She represents Clark County Assembly District 4, and this will be her second term. She's uh, lived in Nevada since 1993, and she is a very hardworking assemblywoman who believes in uh, gun rights. She also believes in medical cannabis and she uh, um, medical cannabis issues for patients. She's a very um, active patient advocate. No doubt. Absolutely. She's a very unique woman. Uh, I mean, I'm just going to leave it at that. She is just an awesome supporter and we're just, we were so proud to have her support during the legislature and we're looking forward to what we can do this coming session. She has over 24 years of business and on entrepreneurial experience and she owns a company that deals with healthcare issues and provides sick uh, care to the sick and the elderly. So yeah, uh, I remember like having a lunch with her at her house and it's amazing to me that she just like opens her house up for dinner parties and movie parties and it's to all of her constituents, not just people with money. It's, it's really kind of refreshing to see that, that attitude in politics. No doubt. Mind if I jump into some regional news real quick? Sure. No, no. Folks, so, gotta... Michelle, we, uh, we, we honor you for our 420 moment. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I got a little bit of news from uh, our border state of Oregon, which is now a recreationally legal states. Some people kind of forget that we share a 200 mile border with Oregon, north of Winnemucca. And uh, they're talking about who is going to co-chair the marijuana committee in the Oregon legislature. Veteran state Senator Ginny Burdick of Portland and freshman representative Ann Linegar of Lake Oswego will co-chair a joint legislative committee overseeing implementation of the new voter approved law legalizing marijuana. The two Democrats will be in the middle of a broad array of marijuana related issues coming before the committee, including whether they're going to make any changes to Measure 91, which was approved by voters in November. Also, the panel is going to consider what kind of direction lawmakers will give to the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, which is going to oversee the production and sale of the drug for recreational purposes. And I like that. They're going to just kind of lop it in with another pre-existing uh, government entity to try to save some cash and streamline the process a little bit. Some of the legislators have already said that they want tighter restrictions on where stores can be located and on marijuana infused edibles. Well, you know, we're seeing some of that in Colorado already, the backlash with edibles and you know, zoning restrictions in certain municipalities, even here in Nevada. So that's nothing really surprising also. Uh, but surprisingly, one senator has suggested this week that the medical marijuana program in Oregon should be shut down after retail sales start. Now, the article doesn't really what? go into that any deeper, but I think that's really the main point of the article to me because, of course, we were aware that there was going to be funds allocated to start the program and, and this and that was going to happen, but for someone to state, someone in an authoritative position like that to state during this this feeling out process that they should just shut down the entire medical program, uh, that's kind of... That's crazy. That, that's disappointing. You know, I've always felt like medical patients were, were different than recreational users in certain ways and they needed... Uh, I, I just want to call it special protections, I guess, for their right to grow and things of that nature. Well, you know, the medical marijuana patients in Nevada are part of a vulnerable population because not only are, are we vulnerable because we're medical marijuana patients, but we also have illnesses. Um, and for for somebody just to say that, oh, okay, recreational is a, is, is a blanket use and, and you guys don't need medical anymore it is, is kind of disheartening You're, it, for sure because... People that are getting medicine shouldn't have to pay taxes on their medicine. Now, in Oregon, right. if you're a medical patient and you no longer have medical access, you're probably going to be paying um, not only taxes on this oh, medication, okay. right. but you're going to be paying for it at a higher rate. I see. I see what you mean. So unless these uh, 
Well, I guess there is no unless. I was going to say unless these dispensaries had some kind of medical program that was independent, just them. I mean, but you have to have the state regulating on all, it almost. Otherwise, it'll just kind of run amok of itself. So, well, you know. I mean, it it should not only they should not only have. Um, the recreational use, but I think that they should continue to have their medical program like Colorado because people in Colorado that are medical patients pay less for their marijuana. They pay less. They don't pay taxes on it, and they also get better strains and more consideration. I don't understand why it seems like in many states this seems to be happening. Even here in Nevada, there's been grumblings about that. Hey, you know, we want to take the patient's right, uh, patient's right to grow away if, you know, we have dispensaries. I mean, we're not even talking about uh, recreational recreational legalization here. They just want no patients to be able to grow if there is access to a dispensary. So you're basically kind of forcing people to, to go into the capitalist market to have them set the price for you rather than you kind of do your own thing. And I, I just don't really understand the logic behind uh, behind recriminalizing nonviolent behavior. Is, is, it seems to be what they're trying to do. I mean, I don't know whether that's the primary goal. They're like, oh, we're gonna cr go out here and create criminals. But you know, that's in essence what they're doing is they're taking people who are just doing what the state told them to do and making it a, and making it a jailable offense all of a sudden. Well, you so. know, not only that, if you're growing at home and you've got your price down to about $60 an ounce to grow it, why are you going to shut down that room and take all of that equipment out of that room and now go buy it at $400 an ounce? Right. And That's we've crazy. Had, yeah, we've had this conversation on the show a few times, and it just seems to be a recurring theme is that these people just don't don't get it. More and more politicians seem to be wanting to do it, but uh, I hopefully think this it is, doesn't really get any traction. And I think this is how they pass it through to get it past law enforcement. Oh, Oh, well, any grow that you walk into now is going to be illegal because we're going to have this in the bill. So nobody's going to be growing in their houses. So you don't have to worry about that. I'm almost wondering at this point whether like how many how much resources law enforcement is really throwing toward this or whether someone someone behind it like, you know, maybe it is Big Farmer or another kind of entity that's kind of pulling the strings a little bit. I, I, I almost wonder, you know, who's really doing this at this point. Um, I, I don't know. After what I saw last legislative session, I saw you know grumblings from the police department, but really it was Big Pharma who was who making was the big donations to try to really kill our bill. So I, I, I don't know. I guess I got more regional news from Alaska. Lots of news from Alaska. Well, I was going to say I think Raymond Alaska. has some more from Oregon. Raymond, do you have more from Oregon? I do, and I pay my taxes. A U.S. <laughs> judge in Portland hears government position on cannabis and it sentences a bulk marijuana runner. Just two days after voters in Oregon, Oregon re legalized recreational use of cannabis, a federal judge in Portland delayed the sentencing of a Texas marijuana smuggler to get clarity on whether the U.S. Department of Justice position on the drug was shifting. Mm, I can tell you right now that if you brought if you brought cannabis in from Texas to Oregon, you're breaking federal law, and there are no there are no reshifting on that crap. Well, this guy whose name I can't even say, his <laughs> name is Bong. Bong pleaded guilty. Bong. Guilt I, did Bong. I did an article on him a few weeks ago. <laughs> Bong pleaded guilty in July to smuggling up to 36 pounds of high end cannabis at a time across state lines. Um, he was in front of Judge Michael Mossman for his sentencing hearing. Uh, the government prosecutor clarified the government's position that there has not been a change in the Department of Justice's policy on marijuana. What Bong did in this case is not consistent under Measure 91 and is not legal under Texas state law. Mossman said his job was to find a fair sentence for Bong, who he noted had a somewhat troubling criminal history, but had made improvements in his life while waiting trial outside of jail. The judge sentenced Bong to two and a half years in prison in order to him to turn himself in to U.S. Marshals on January 22nd, 2015. <laughs> so Bong will be token up for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a little news out of uh, California. Uh, remember last week we were talking about the Emerald Cup, which yes, is the flower competition. Yeah. Well, it sold out like it does oh, all wow. the time. So they estimated over 10,000 people attended the Epi Epic Festival in wine country over the weekend. Um, and uh, a couple of the uh, awards they handed out, they handed out the Lifetime Achievement Award to Fred Gardner, who is a longtime activist, researcher, journalist, and founder of the medical cannabis journal, O'Shaughnessy's. 
And judges awarded first prize. Now, first prize uh, in this for the flower competition, it was a trip for two to Jamaica. Ooh. Uh, and they awarded first prize to in flowers to Mendocino County breeder and grower Joe Pinado for his customized breed of Diesel X Ogre, which tested at 26.51% THC. That's a lot of THC. Yeah. That's unreal. Pentino has been grown in, in California since 1987. Um, and this is the first time he's entered the cup. And he bested more than 600 other entrants from across the state to win a free trip to two to Jamaica and, and the title of California's best breeder and grower. Hmm. Something for the resume. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's a that's that's a good one. Uh, you know, having that kind of stuff on your resume, if you're growing and providing medical cannabis things, I'm sure that you draw a little extra top dollar for that. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, <laughs> more news out of California. It's like a push me pull you. Uh, Perry and I were talking about this earlier. The the tax certificates are issued to LA's unauthorized pot shops create moral hazards. So Perry. What do you have to say about this? Well, uh, I worked at a at a pre-ICO dispensary in Los Angeles for a period of time. And what pre-ICO means or how I interpret it is when the medical marijuana movement in California first kind of got rolling and people started opening shops, there were these licenses granted, 135 of them, I believe there were. And yes. those are the, quote, pre-ICO dispensaries that got in that had the original uh business license certificates from the city of Los Angeles. Like, look, you are a medical marijuana dispensary. You are good to go. And then all of a sudden, like it just blew up and there were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of shops, maybe even thousands. I mean, I don't know what it really ended up getting to. Okay. But, uh, now there was this, they tried to rein it back and they're like, look, there are way too many stores. They're unregulated. We got to do something. So they passed Proposition D. Yep. Proposition D says, we're going to take it all the way back to the 135 original shops. We're going to kick everyone else out and we're just going to shut you guys down. Well, it's a little more complex than that because what is happening is even though that the city attorney and the police department is going after these shops that do not have pre-ICO licenses, they're still collecting tax revenue from about 500 weed stores. 450, and they issued tax registration certificates for these 450. So not only are they <laughs> taking their money, they're giving them tax certificates saying that they owe money. You see, so you're taking my money and you're taking me to jail. Because they're because they're taking their money and then they're proceeding to go in and bust them anyway, so, so that's like well, you know very confusing. If anything, I mean it's r kind of ridiculous and I, it's a it's a crazy line. How the hell, what what are they going to do? They can't let these people operate for free and not collect taxes. So, so while the city attorney and the police department are trying to close these rogue pot shops, the office of finance keeps cranking out new tax certificates <laughs> for them to pay for those same dispensaries. Uh, instead of giving them, you know, shutdown notices and say that you need to close this shop and and we're not going to accept your money from you and and stuff like that, they're still giving new tax certificates out to the same dispensaries who are operating illegally. Um, it, there, the city collected three point six million dollars in business taxes this year from all of those dispensaries, and while they whether they were allowed to operate or not, um, the finance department has only recently begun sharing the list of tax paying pot shops with the police department. So it's worse than that. They were greedy. They know they're greedy, and now they're they're reluctantly giving these names to the police department. So now that they've paid these taxes and be given a tax certificate, now the police can go in and just raid them whole hog this is this is why state regulation is imperative california is such a mess i mean i just really hope that they're able to get everything together out there before before it implodes or i i, I don't know what could happen i just really hope that they they get it together whatever it takes well yeah. measure d measure d the the original um measure was basically saying that these 135 dispensaries had already been vetted they were far enough from schools they were far enough from parks far far enough from residential um so they had their hearings like we're going through here in, in um in southern nevada and northern nevada and they are legal shops these 135 measure d and it's the, your pre-ico that you're speaking mm -hmm. of and then when everybody else just kind of went boom and started opening up and then applying for tax certificates they should have been denied 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 deny yeah well they weren't and here we are <laughs> exactly or here so, they are how's uh washington state doing well washington state they actually uh 
They actually, the Seattle Times uh, did a letter to the editor, and uh, they asked readers of last Sunday's editorial uh, on medical marijuana, how is marijuana legalization going so far, and what would you change? And they got some, they got some interesting responses from people. Uh, people were going from the medical system has been treated poorly in legalizing recreational marijuana, and that it's effective medicine for many conditions. Some say it's doing well. And the aspect, the medical aspect has to be changed, make them pay taxes and regulate them just like retail, mm. uh, you know, and then other people are saying that uh, they should just uh, be able to go to recreational things and not have to pay the taxes there if they're medical card holders. So, but these are all just opinions from the people that... Uh, that came to this hearing? No, it wasn't a hearing. It was a, a letter from the Seattle Times, a letter to the editor. They uh, asked the general public what their what thoughts thought? on it were. So, Well... You know, at least they weren't Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right. Zing. Exactly. Zing. Raymond, you got anything for oh, us? Oh, I can go now? Well, I didn't know you were waiting. Everybody keeps, I'm just laying back here trying to talk, people stepping on me. I'll just sit back here quietly. Mm-hmm. Washington State. Seattle plans crackdown on pot delivery businesses. Ed Murray, who is the mayor of Seattle, wants the delivery businesses to be shut down. They became popular in 2012 after Washington uh, legalized marijuana. If businesses are caught, they will be told to close and they'll have their cannabis seized. If they're caught a second time, Seattle police will make arrests. The Seattle Times reports that the city's effort to target marijuana delivery businesses some which advertise to recreational consumers and out-of-staters. Though the state requires recreational marijuana retail license, retailers to be licensed, the state's medical marijuana program is unregulated. One, one delivery business owner told the Seattle, staff, uh, Seattle Times staff that he has no plans of shutting down. Well, if you told me that the cops are going to take all my weed and tell me very nicely to not do it anymore. I mean, people are definitely going to operate until they at least get that first warning, I would assume for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Regardless of whether they should shut down or not, you know, that's very nice of them to give them that uh that grace period, I suppose what they're calling it. Yeah, for sure. Do you have anything from Alaska, Perry? I got tons of stuff from Alaska. Oh, right it seems on. like there's always news from Alaska these days. Okay, uh, there is a proposed ban on all medical marijuana establishments within the city of Anchorage that's being proposed tomorrow. Uh, it's a, it's a, how do I put this? It's like a ballot, uh, ballot, uh, uh, excuse me, hold on. It's an ordinance. That's what they call it. I'm so okay. sorry. It's, I, I got train wrecked right there. On December 16th, there is a vote going down, and it's basically all that we saw here in Nevada right after our bill passed. Uh, right after Senate Bill 374 passed, all of the local municipalities were just really upset. They're just like, oh my God, you know, we're not going to have this in our backyard, and, you know, not going to happen, and we're not going to stand for it. And, you know, one by one, very, very slowly, all of the municipalities folded up. You know, Mesquite, Pahrump. Northtown, Henderson, they all ended up folding. And I think Boulder City was the only one that actually stuck to their guns and said, you know, we don't want it. But uh, but regardless of that, you know, the people in Alaska or the organizers of the ballot are really upset. They're like, you know, how can you put this out there before we've even had a chance to look at the potential regulations? And, you know, the, the law hasn't even gone into effect yet, and they're already looking to ban it. I remember the city of Las Vegas was looking at something like that. They're like, oh, well, we're going to ban it, and then we'll opt back in later if we want to opt back in later. That's right, because they had one of the state representatives sat down. Actually, I think was Senator Siegerblum that was there when um, the mayor, Mayor Goodman, asked if we opt out today, can we come back and do it again? And uh, Senator Siegerblum said no. no. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that. You see, so that's why it's so important for people to make their voices heard at these local, these local council meetings. People think, oh, you know, you know, they're not listening to me and they've already made up their minds. It's like, you know, sometimes they have and sometimes they haven't. A lot of these people don't really know what they're, I don't want to say I don't know what they're talking about, but they're just looking for information. They're looking to be educated and they're just looking for the right, the right thing to sway them one way or the other. And, uh, and until that point, they have a knee jerk reaction like, nope, we're not going to do it. Well, and it's just this one person. Once again, just like yeah. we had here, it was a minority 
of the council who's just like, look, you know, I'm going to do what I can to try to put the brakes on this and overturn the ballot measure right now before it even gets any traction. But there's a lot of opposition to it right now, and uh, hopefully nothing comes of it. And also there is a Tina, uh, Kenai town hall meeting set for tonight. A uh, group of Kenai Peninsula citizens interested in area concerns over legalized marijuana ahead of any move on the part of local lawmakers to regulate cannabis plan to meet next week discuss, or this week to discuss future steps. Soldatna trial attorney Eric Derleth announced that he is hosting a town hall meeting to allow participants with differing views to discuss the impacts of marijuana legalization. The meeting is scheduled for 6 p.m. Tuesday at the Kenai Central High School. Now, uh, I mean, that's the biggest town on the Kenai Peninsula that represents a good amount of people down there and once again it's just another small battle to win all these local municipalities we got to start this fight early because of course if you don't make your voice heard people will walk all over you and uh, I mean that's it from Alaska for now so I guess we're going to our second break and uh, we'll catch you when we get back Finally, Nevada medical marijuana dispensaries are opening, but you must have your medical marijuana card to get inside. Call the friendly team at Karma Holistic Health Foundation toll free 855-420-1110 or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Karma Holistic Health Foundation will give you legal access to medical marijuana. All veterans receive a discount 855-420-1110 or visit GetMedicalMarijuanaNow.com. Green Spot Hydroponics is a Las Vegas-based distributor of specialty indoor and outdoor gardening supplies. Locally owned and operated with over 3,000 square feet of inventory. Expert and friendly staff to help you with all your growing and hydroponic needs. Our pricing and service will not be beat. We help you grow. 3355 Westlake Mead Boulevard, just behind the Texas station. Mention we can and receive 10% off. Call us at 702-463-6000. That's 702-463-6000. You're listening to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, produced by We Can, the wellness education cannabis advocates of Nevada. We Can is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you're interested in sponsoring us, donating, or advertising on this radio show, please contact our advertising department at 702 218 5226 or Kurt, K U R T, at WeCan702.org. Hi, welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News. This is Jennifer Solis. I'm here with Kurt Dukoch, Raymond Fletcher, Perry Haichu, uh, and William Beach Baker. Of course, Lawrence is making us sound good as always on the board. Uh, we've got some more news um, from Washington. Yeah, don't we? State or district? I think oh, the well, Washington guess, district. Not state. District. District of Columbia, you mean? E <laughs> Yeah, um, Congress recently voted on a um, spending bill. It was a $1.1 trillion spending bill. The a U.S. House of Representatives voted on it. But in the depths tucked far, far away in the 1600, over 1,600-page document is a provision that prohibits federal agents from raiding retail medical cannabis operations in states that have legalized medical cannabis. The passage represents, quote, the first time in decades that the federal government has curtailed its oppressive prohibition of marijuana. That's according to Dana Rohrbecker, the measure's co-author. In, in the same budget bill, Congress smacked down Washington, D.C.'s referendum uh, decriminalizing cannabis, as I told you that that U.S. representative was going to do. Just like a drunk simultaneously walking forward and back at the same time. Just like our, our policies in cannabis, it's ridiculous. But it's regardless a huge, it's a huge, huge victory. victory. Huge <laughs> victory. You know, I there's a lot of press about the guy who put that uh, that clause in that was going to strip DC of its power to implement the bill. Do we have any news about who slipped that piece in that stripped the federal government of all this power? Like, who's the hero that put that put that in? I want to say Chris Van Hollen. But don't hold it to me because I don't have his name in front of me. Okay. But I do remember listening to him on CNN talking about that. Now, what about the Senate? Have they talked about when they're going to take this up? Or has Obama given any inkling to where, you know, hey, he's going to sign this? Or I, I, I think he's golfing or on a vacation somewhere <laughs> or doing something somewhere screwing Americans. 
Are we talking about Obama? Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking we got we got to have the Senate pass the bill first, and then he's got to sign it. But I mean, it, it's it's good news all around for sure. All right. Well, uh, I was gonna say, you got anything else for us, Raymond? Or Perry? Perry. <laughs> well, sure. I have a I have a op-ed here about uh, the Native American tribes being now allowed to grow and sell marijuana on their on their uh, reservations and their sovereign property. It's just kind of, I mean, it's kind of a, I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but it's kind of silly that the government's telling these people, well, hey, even though we've gifted you this sovereign nation and this land is completely yours to do what you want, well, now we're actually giving you permission to do this one thing that it turns out you weren't allowed to do on this. And I'm sure and, they weren't doing it. No, of course <laughs> not. And I've talked to a lot of people who know people on tribes and they're like look we've been growing for years on these reservations and they never really arrested people they would just come and take the plants and this and that but uh i guess this is just kind of like the when governor sandoval signed our bill like we didn't need it but damn it was really nice to have it like really nice ceremonious dot of approval for the government to finally say look you're allowed to do this and the native american tribes have done very well for themselves they've been very yep. successful with other uh Entrepreneurial ventures like, you know, the Siri Casinos? Corporation. Yeah, the Siri Corporation in Alaska does very well for them, for the tribes, and uh, the Choctaws in Mississippi have a casino as well as a lot of other Indians do. And I'm hoping that maybe some of these tribal elders will kind of take a look at this new and emerging industry and think maybe well, this I was is for them. Within the past ten years, the um, the increase in Native American gaming it has been huge. It's been huge. Mm -hmm. There, there are now there are now. Um, in Choctaw in Oklahoma um, there uh, and Mississippi he said mm -hmm. um, there are also a lot of California tribes that have uh, that have casinos now that oh, never yeah. had before because some of my friends now oh I'm going to the casino in California and I'm like what casino oh well it's this you know casino and they're telling me about these Native American uh, gambling casinos that are going on um, there are 16 casinos in Minnesota that belong to the Native oh, American wow. people. And, and so this has been a huge industry for them. Well, and they could do it tax-free. They could do it. I mean, they could do whatever they want. Let's just see what happens. You know, I mean, it, it's just coming out. The word just came down. But the first thing that comes to my mind right away is uh, the Paiutes have a smoke shop down on down on Washington Main Street. I mean, they could turn that into a dispensary. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, for sure. do what they wanted right there in the middle of town. So, you know, well, let's see off if of anyone ninety five, they yeah. have off of at the Snow Mountain, uh, the Snow Mountain exit. There is a huge, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tobacco shop too. And and we'll see if anyone uh, we'll right see, off of we'll fifteen. See if anyone tries they have to bite a that. fireworks stand yeah, that we'll are up there too. We'll see if anyone tries to uh, take that bait, as they say, or try to try to influence them one way or the other. And uh, I got a little news from Texas. Oh, oh what's happening deep in the heart of Texas? <laughs> well. Texas, a Texas lawmaker is proposing lower marijuana penalties. On Monday, Texas State Representative Joe Moody introduced a bill that would remove criminal penalties for the possession of small amounts of marijuana. He, his, he's quoted by saying that our current marijuana policy in Texas just isn't working, end quote. He said in a statement that we need a new approach that allows us to more effectively utilize our limited criminal justice resources. This legislation is a much needed step in the right direction. Under current Texas law, possessing up to two ounces of weed can yield six months of jail time and a $2,000 penalty. Under the proposal, adults caught with up to one ounce would get a $100 ticket, similar to a parking violation. Larger amounts would of course still lead to, still lead to criminal penalties. And the measure would make Texas the 20th state plus the District of Columbia to remove the threat of jail time for the possession of small amounts of cannabis. The latter are two long shots, and the first is not going to be an easy sell to the Republican-controlled legislature, and, you know, Texas is uh, notoriously conservative, so you know, it's going to be an uphill battle. Uh, Texas Governor well, Rick Perry has said that he opposes legalization. He has, he has, uh, well, he, he says he's that he's a he, big jerk. He, yeah, well, he says he supports decriminalizing it, but also said that the state has, quote, kind of done that. In 07, Texas passed a measure giving local governments the power to respond to marijuana possession with a summons rather than an arrest. But very few counties or cities have adopted it, and some have it, and some issued a summons. They still kind of take people to jail. They issued the summons, then when you show up for the summons, they still take you to jail. So 
you know, just because they've given... That's right. We make them come to us. <laughs> well, and then we do, throw them in jail. They do that in Arizona. They'll issue you a summons and then make you come back and then take you to jail and then make you go through the process. Uh, it, it, it's just one of those <laughs> things, you know. A step in the right direction is a step in the right direction. We can only hope that, that small groups like the Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition who are pay, based in Austin can try to try to use their flex a little bit to influence some of these people down there to uh, make the right decision on behalf of the entire state and not just what their supposed moral compass guides them to you know kinky friedman has been uh has been running for governor of texas for the longest time if he ever gets into the into the gubernatorial mansion you know he would just like decriminalize it and and make it you know legal for everybody to smoke it right up on the uh steps of you know uh, of the state house there in Texas. Well, my first taste of Texas was Austin oh. for, for the F1 race, and I was just like totally not what I had in mind for Texas. That is not like Texas. A, no. I think Austin's worlds apart. No, I've I lived had, in Texas. No, I had no idea what I was getting, you know, flying into, and it was just this really rad, like, bohemian town with great food and goofy people and all that, and just let's see if it spreads yeah, we'll see <laughs> right on now so, so for now for some happy holiday news speaking of trees <laughs> yeah this was reported by weed maps this week uh uh even in 2014 the best kind of christmas tree is illegal pretty much everywhere we're talking about the much maligned Cushmas tree <laughs> <laughs> isn't that where we're having this year kurt Cushmas tree. yeah well there was a chilean woman busted for a marijuana christmas tree uh, although mar medical marijuana farms may now be legal in Chile, growing weed in your own home can still get you locked up, especially if you're riding dirty like Chilean mother uh, in San Bernardino, South Chile was. 50-year-old Chilean mother Angelica Navarro was really stoked to show her children the best Christmas tree in the world because her tree was a marijuana tree. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wasn't her only tree in the house, and the Chilean authorities snuffed out what could have been a very merry Cushmas. Oh, my God. <laughs> so nobody going to catch her riding dirty? <laughs> no. Um, what about you, Raymond? You riding dirty? I hate that song. People think <laughs> it's cool to be singing it to me because I am in a wheelchair, uh, and I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so... So as she was being dragged away by the police, her neighbor uh, said, thinking about it, she didn't invite me in to see her tree when, when I spoke to her yesterday. She said her children were going to really enjoy Christmas this year and that she had the best tree in the world. I don't remember seeing her take one in now. Now I know why. <laughs> oh she was arrested with 2,500 pounds of cash. 21 cannabis plants and two homemade shotguns and 29 bags of drugs. This what? <laughs> yeah, this report does not specify what the drugs were, but I'd have to assume they were cannabis. Um, so uh, this is a 50-year-old woman growing a little weed, 21 plants, not some cartel kingpin running from Chile to America like the report seems to uh, insinuate. So. <laughs> She was suspected for uh, in, uh, involved for being involved in trafficking, and uh, they went in and they performed a raid. And there lo you behold, go. they didn't expect to find one of her plants being used as a Christmas tree. Aww. <laughs> oh, right. Raven, do you have some news out of Colorado? Like, what's have, going on? I have two pieces of news right quick. Sure. Colorado is marking two years of legal cannabis. Woo! Last Wednesday, uh, Colorado marked its second anniversary for recreational cannabis for adults over 21. Voters approved Amendment 64 in November 2012. December 10th of 2012, Governor Hickenlooper formalized it as part of the state constitution. It was a procedural step. It was a procedural but important step. The governor's executive order was the first public declaration that Colorado wouldn't try to block marijuana legalization or ask the federal government, which considers cannabis illegal, to intervene. Hickenlooper also announced a task force, force to start regulating cannabis as a signal that Colorado planned to actively manage legalization instead of wait for possible lawsuit. And the other one is district attorney in Denver is telling their employees no to recreational cannabis. Oh, boy. Oh, so we'll he's going to fire them for recreational use, but they can drink all they want. Drink it up. It's a Christmas Right, and, and I'll bring more on that uh, next week.
No doubt. We're running out of time, but we got some announcements, Jen? Yeah, we have a holiday party on the 27th of December. It's in our great new venue. Um, check our website, www.wecan702.org, for details and the location. Um, and Text we can to 22828 to join our mailing list. 22828. Mm -hmm. To join our mailing list, and you'll be sent out all the announcements for all of these parties. Uh, we just attended a Wonder Soil thing last night. It was really, really great. Um, good job, guys, at the Medical Marijuana Business Association. Uh, that party really walked. And be safe out there, everybody.